What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Real Bodybuilding Podcast. This is episode number 164, a long time awaited guest, Mike, Dr. Mike Isertel, sports scientist. How are you, sir? Excellent. Well, I'm a big fan. <clears throat> I'm so nervous. My throat got raspy. Um, <laughs> thanks for having me on the podcast, man. I, uh, I've been doing this now for a few years and I've gotten, you're maybe my most requested guest. And I think I've just been too intimidated to have you on because like, yeah. dude, bad news, man. If I'm your most requested guest, your podcast sounds like circling the drain for sure. You know, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> this is like from the beginning, because I've always done these, like, you know, obviously I have the guys on, you know, the pros that come on and they talk about their careers, but I have coaches on from time to time to talk about, mm -hmm. cause I don't, I don't really debate the guests. I just like to get as much mm -hmm. uh, of their thoughts as possible. So I have various coaches on. So it's nice to have, finally have you on. Um, I was talking to Mike uh, Lakamowski mm -hmm. and he was telling me uh, about your RP app mm -hmm. and how popular it's become and how, many people are using it and it's one of the most popular exercise training apps online and, or that you can get on any platform. So can you tell me a little bit about that before we delve into some other things? Totally. Yeah. So we have an app, it's called the RP hypertrophy app because RP is Renaissance periodization, the company I co-founded with my friend, Nick. And the app basically is kind of a, a universal workout generator there are preset workouts in there you can just plug and play and you just go like it can take you 30 seconds to set up an entire month of workouts if you just really want to start training yeah but i think the best feature of the app is the customization so you can pick any exercises that you want in any order that you want in any number of days that you want so you can construct entirely the plan that you desire mm -hmm. and it's completely agnostic to workout style you can do um, mike menser one set to failure hit on it if you want you can do ultra high volume. You can do anything in between. It helps you set up a workout plan. And then what it does is it displays like yep, day one or Monday, whatever you labeled it as. It can do asynchronous splits. So day one doesn't have to be Monday. It could just be called day one. And like whenever you heal up, it's day one, Monday, Tuesday. Yeah. You get in there and it has all your exercises that you picked. And it has uh, you, it's, there's instructions for how to pick weights to train with, you know, anything in the five to 30 rep range. Again, it's agnostic to that. It doesn't judge you on that. But it's, what it does is two things that are, I think, really cool. One is, is once you hit all of your numbers for the first week, like whatever you like, did 10 reps with 100 pounds and then incline dumbbell press, the next week it automatically says you either need to do more weight and it displays that weight for you already with the same number of reps or if you change the weight, so that's a little heavy, it automatically increases the reps. So it's it forces you to try to hit a mini PR every single week to yeah. get a little bit better every single week. Cause like, you know how it is like real life training, especially when you're in prep, you did like, let's say you squatted 400 for 10 last week and it was mm -hmm. hard as fuck. Am I allowed to swear on this? Is that okay? Yeah. yeah you can swear all you want. Yeah. Wait, all right, right on. <laughs> I, I do a few podcasts and every now and again, I'm like, I'm not going to be a degenerate and try not to swear. No, no, this so, is a, this is a de degenerate platform. We're good. <laughs> excellent. Excellent. <laughs> like, like-minded folks here. So, um, you know, next week it's like, ideally you would do sets of 400 for like 11 reps or something yeah. like that, or four or five, but like you're tired and you're hungry and you're pissed and your knees kind of feel weird. And you're like, man, I'm just going to go and like do three something, you know, like the excuses we tell ourselves, which yeah. is sometimes valid, but it's like, I'm just going to do 315, but do it for high reps, you know, whatever it is to like tuck your tail between your legs and run the fuck away from a challenge, but the apps of machine. So just like the next, you, you open your next week and cause it knows what you did last week. It automatically, it's like 405 for 10 and you look at it and you're like, I know this is the right thing to do because science or whatever. Yeah. And then you just have to do it. You have to challenge yourself like that every single week until it lets you deload. And that's a really cool part of the app because it kind of holds your own feet to the fire. It's mm -hmm. basically like you said you wanted to do this. This is what this means, you know? Yeah. And the second thing that I think it does that's really cool is pretty unique for apps that do training is it does auto regulation, which means you tell it how pumped you're getting. You tell it how sore you're getting. You're telling it how, how much your joints hurt versus how your muscles are stimulated. Yeah. And you're also telling it like a general workload thing where it's like, I did this many sets of triceps. Like, how did you feel after that? You could say like, oh, like I felt like it was just a warm up. I felt like pretty fucking good. Like it got, got a good hit out of it. I felt like this is really pushing my limits and no more it would be ideal and another one is like this is way too much you know like mm -hmm. that's i this is not sustainable then the way you hit all those ratings it changes 
what your program looks like next week, mostly by adding and subtracting how many sets you do. So people ask like, how many sets am I supposed to be doing? There's actually no correct answer to that question until you get in the gym and you watch how your body recovers. And if you're over recovered, like let's say someone pulled you aside for and they're like, hey, like I'm a super brilliant muscle scientist. You're like, okay, tell me how to train. And they're like one set of bicep curls a week, your bicep would be fucking huge. You'd be like, okay, you do the set. And then Monday, you get a little pump doing the set. Tuesday, you don't feel shit. Wednesday, you're like, bro, I can literally be right now training biceps. They're like, no, trust me, like growth takes a long time or some stupid shit. And then by Friday, you're like, this guy's a fucking liar. But if <laughs> if you tell the app, oh, I barely felt shit, next week it adds a set. And you're like, ah, I've still barely felt shit, it adds a set. And then that way, at some point, you're so sore that you barely heal on time for your next bicep session. Yeah. And then when you tell it that, it doesn't add any more sets because it knows you're pushing as far as you can push. So via those algorithms, via the app talking to you basically and asking you shit, it ends up you collaboratively with the app end up making the best workout possible for you according to your very own body's ability to recover and stimulate. Okay. And in addition to that, real quick, sure. it's totally customized. So you can always change the weight. The app doesn't like not let you do it. You can add and subtract a set. So you're always able to make on the fly adjustments because the algorithms are good. We're all super smart or whatever the fuck at RP, but we're not that fucking smart. So you know your body better than anyone else. And if the shit says three sets of leg press and you're like, man, last time two fucked me up way too much. I'm just going to do two this time. The app's like dope, cool. And it remembers that. And next week it might keep two or go up to three. It's not like you're just going to go magically to four as if it's some part of a pre-program plan. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a, a mix of the app's intelligence and it kind of infinite user customizability. You can even switch out exercises too. You're like, I'm not feeling leg press today. I'm on pack squat. It's like two buttons, replace exercise, pick exercise. That's it. And it'll launch it for you. So I don't want people that are watching this to think this is an RP ad. Uh, we're not, I'm not sponsored by RP. This isn't, but I'm genuinely curious about the app. So that's why we're, sure. we're getting into this first, just so people know, I don't want people to get the wrong idea, but um, so question about the app. It's basically like, having a real coach help you through your training but how did you develop it in such a way that it's that intuitive because it doesn't like all of a sudden it sounds like i don't even need a training coach because this thing's doing it for me yeah yeah so there are things that will do that what coach will do there are things that will do better than a coach technically can do and there are things that won't do at all that a coach uh, has to do and thus it doesn't replace coaching it just augments it but okay. if you don't have enough uh, you know coaches like let's be honest coaches cost kind of a fucking lot of money sometimes. Yeah. And sometimes it's worth it like crazy. Mm -hmm. But for some folks just dipping their toe in, maybe doing their first like serious cycle and bodybuilding training. Yeah, I'm not trying to pay some motherfucker $500 a month for my first time at the shit. Like when yeah. I feel like I really like bodybuilding, I'll pay somebody to put me on stage or whatever. Yeah. So the way we developed the app was we wrote a book called The Scientific Principles of Hypertrophy Training. And when we wrote that book at RP and myself and Jared Feather is one of the co-authors in that, I be pro you guys you know who he is I'm yeah sure. i know jared yeah um, yeah and um we wrote that book and while writing that book the way we write books is we only write them based on like dependable principles we don't like to make a lot of guesses uh so once we had enough scientific literature and enough insight from training our own athletes that we could uh write the book we wrote it based on principles and these principles can be put into mathematical language uh like there's an algorithm for how do i know if i'm supposed to add sets to bench press next week, subtract sets or stay the same. We can put that in mathematical language that a computer can understand. And then okay. the computer can execute the function. If you tell it the information it needs, it has a very dependable set of calculations it does and goes, okay, my best guess is that you should do three sets of bench versus the two you did last week or the four you did last week. So it collects all the inputs, it filters them in, and then it has the output. The reason it does that is because like, I went to school for a long ass time. So did Jared. I've been training for I get to like 22 years or something now. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got nothing to show for it, but I'm trying, you know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> and then, you know, we learned a ton of shit and we kind of learned how muscle growth and training work at a level uh, just deep enough to be able to get a computer to understand it, you know? Okay. And that's how come the app works really well. Now the app can, do technical programming really well like it'll pick your you can pick all of your exercises after you do that it can even do that for you mm -hmm. it, it, it it progresses your weights really well it progresses your volumes really well it tells you when to deload all that stuff it's great okay. but the app is not a human it has no internal psychology so if you're being a like a bitch the app's going to be like hey like you're supposed to do this 
But if you're like, nah, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to push out of this. I'm going to do way less weight and way fewer reps. It's not going to yell at you. It can't threaten you. We're trying to work a way in which the app like electrically shocks you. If you, I'm just kidding. That'd be sweet, right? Your phone just shocks you. You're like, okay, fuck, fuck. I'll do 400. Fuck. But um, it doesn't do any of that. So at the end of the day, you still got an up uh, and do your shit. And there's something magical with a coach where like, if your coach DMs you later and he's like, Hey, did you hit up that squat workout? Man, you're not going to tell him like, Oh yeah. yeah. But like my some make some shit up about yeah. your knees. Yeah. You're going to, you know, you're going to have to DM him. And then you're going to like, okay, I have to do the shit. So the app, if you, the app is not a replacement for hard work. It is not a replacement for effort it is not a replacement for willpower. But if you have all those things and you need like a bit more of a dependable path to know you're doing the right shit to grow the most, mm-hmm. the app's got you hooked up. So there's a, a ton of questions that came from uh, everything you just told me. So the first question I, I have is, so you said basically you can put in whatever you want. So I'm going to reference uh, my best friend, Paul, and people who watch the podcast know Paul. And uh, he's been training for 30, 40 years. And sometimes he'll even go on, like when we used to work with John Meadows, he loved it because he didn't have to think. He would just do John's workout for the day or whatever it Mm -hmm. was, right? Mm -hmm. Or like when me and him train, usually I lead the workout. He doesn't care. He doesn't want to plan the workout. He just wants to do whatever it is we're doing. Yeah. So the benefit to the uh, app, in my opinion, well, one of the benefits is that it's going to help you create your workouts. But what if you don't know what to plug in? Like if I come to the thing and I'm like, I want to work out chest, will it give me a chest workout or do I have to tell it what I want to do? Because then it kind of defeats the purpose of a beginner. Yeah. So straight up, there's just two answers to this one. It absolutely can tell you what to do. Okay. It doesn't make one workout at a time. You can rig it to do that. No problem. It's yeah. very easy, but yeah. it encourages you to make a program that lasts anywhere between four and six weeks. Cause like Fuad, you and I've been around bodybuilding long enough. You don't get bigger from one fucking workout. Yeah. You get bigger from weeks and weeks and weeks of the shit. Sure. So it tries to get you to write a consistent plan that lasts four to six weeks. That's the first thing. But if you just don't know what the fuck is going on, there are like 30 or something preloaded templates that have like upper body lower body chest emphasis back emphasis shoulders and arms and we're making an update within the next few months that's going to multiply those like many fold and so so that it does the thing is is there are pop-ups you can hit that like describe how to warm up there are exercise videos you can click on that like is there a video for every exercise so if you're like what the fuck is a high bar squat you click on it and it's a video of jared doing it and if you turn up the volume it's me narrating it and telling you how to do it mm. so it can guide relative beginners but to be honest we didn't really build this app for beginners because if we did okay. we'd have this whole tutorial process of like this is a weight here's what a repetition means like <laughs> it's not for mom you know yeah. if mom's been at that iron for a while it is for her but it's not for new new people but if you've been lifting i'll tell you this if you know what a set is you know what a rep is you know what good technique is as an idea like you know that there is an idea of good technique an idea of bad technique you can watch a video and go okay i should do it like this and you know how to push yourself somewhat close to failure the app is for you if you don't have that basic understanding vernacular like if you point to a leg press and you're like is that for arms like man you just need to hire a trainer for a little while to teach you some shit you know no, what I, mean? I, I mean i guess I, I i get what you're saying so paul like i said paul's been training for 30 years so he's not a beginner but i meant more for the guy that just doesn't want to think about programming his own stuff so you already answered oh that and saying that's that exactly who the app is for <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah there's templates and all that so that that makes a lot yeah. of sense um you also mentioned about, so I want to touch on progressive overload a little bit. And you mentioned, you know, increasing reps and, or increasing weight. Mm-hmm. And you touched on being a bitch and not wanting to do the 400. So in my career, I probably reached a point where 400 was an average leg day for me, right? Like mm-hmm. 550 was probably a max. And I wouldn't touch that usually that often. 400 was like my rep range. But I didn't, do you believe that you can keep growing or keep getting better if you're using the same weight and same reps? Like, are you still, Mm. are you still taxing a muscle? Like if I go in and I train legs and I'm failing at 10 every week with four, four or five, am I still training that muscle or is it just going to stay the same? That's a really good question. I can give you the kind of the nuanced answer. So the more complex answer, I'll give the more complex one and the simpler one after that. So more complex answer is anything that is a stimulus, if you repeat it in let's say a week or half a week, it's still a stimulus except its magnitude isn't as great. Uh, The analogy here is like if you go to some restaurant in let's say Toronto and you have like an amazing fettuccine Alfredo, 
The first time you have it, it's fucking unbelievable. The next time you have it, let's say you went back half a week later, like, baby, baby, we got to go back to this place. I need that shit. And it, it, it's going to be good, but it's not going to be like a religious experience. And then you're like, baby, baby, like, let's go again. And she's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Fine. We're going again third time this week. It's going to be like, it's going to be okay, but you're going to be like, you know, I don't, this isn't that great anymore. I'm not going to come back for a while. Yeah. So with training, you know, like four or five for five sets of 10 or some shit. If that's a challenge, like your peak ability to do some, some shit it will 100 grow muscle yeah. if you repeat it a week later and it's a little easier it'll grow a little bit less muscle mm -hmm. and then you keep doing that for a few months it's down to essentially being just what maintains you sure. so the maintenance effect doesn't occur right away but over the long term weeks and months you had better be challenging yourself mm -hmm. no you can't do the same shit and continue to expect long-term gains can you do in the short term yes but also that begs the question of if 405 for 5 by 10 works really well in one week and a little bit not as well in the next week, why don't in the next week I change it some way to make it again challenging so that it's really well week one, really well week two, really well every single week. That's the reason we program in training is yeah. the body adapts and we need to keep up with it. What used to be hard for you isn't hard for you anymore. Mm -hmm. There is no way around making training keeping up the training as difficult as your new, bigger, stronger body needs for it to be. If that wasn't the case, dude, Ronnie Coleman would have gotten to be Ronnie Coleman benching 135 and shit. Wouldn't that be amazing for our joints? It does not work like that. You got to make it harder somehow. So I'm trying to create, I'm trying to create a, a more, a bigger conversation around progressive overload because people generally don't, and maybe I'm one of those people don't fully understand the concept because they're like, well, I, I can only put on so much weight on the bar and I'm like, okay, that's true. And I can only do so many reps. So how do I keep progressing? And the reason I brought up that example is because I think I had a mental block after four or five, I didn't want to get injured. So I just wouldn't go, but I would still do the reps to failure, mm -hmm. but to make it harder, I would do things before or after that exercise that would tax the muscle more so than the week before. So I was always finding a way to create more trauma and keep the muscle growing. So is that a form? Would that be something somebody could say is progressive overload? Like I did, maybe I did three exercises this week before I did my 405, or maybe I did a lot more volume after I did my 405, but one way or another, there was more this week than last week is 100 100 so i can actually break this down on a terminological level so uh overload is a disc is a term we use it's not the best term it's an, an older term we use in exercise and sports science and it's out in the public now so everyone uses it it's a cool term you know yeah. like fuck overload bro so overload is a term that we made up because people realized that muscle growth for example strength works uh, very similar ways the muscle growth stimulus the thing that causes your cells to start growing muscles at least one of those things is dependably what we can describe as an overload it is within the range of difficulty that really pushes your system okay. and overload itself is a shit term because like it doesn't have to be over Overload just means within the range of what is very, very stressful. That's what makes you better. Mm -hmm. And in sports science, we consider things overloading when they're within that range. Now that can mean it's the biggest weight you've ever lifted. It's the most reps you've ever done. You used to do the same weight and reps fresh. Now you're doing it after five sets of dips. So like your triceps are pushed further than ever. So the overload part is probably better termed stimulus. And so the real question you're asking is, am I stimulating a robust amount of muscle growth with what I'm doing. I'm in here to stimulate muscle growth, overload, underload, give a fuck about that. Am I stimulating muscle growth? So stimulus is a better term there. Sure. And then pro progressive, because overload is here and it just like, does it cause a stimulus? Stimulus is here. When we take a look at the term overload, we add progressive to it. That addition is just um, kind of a nod to a discovery that what is considered stimulative and thus what is considered overloading, what is considered something that's your best effort at growing muscle changes over time because mm -hmm. your body adapts. It adapts in at least two ways. One, it becomes inherently more resistant to change, even mm -hmm. if it doesn't get better. Like the first time you do some shit, it makes you sore as fuck. The third time you're like, eh, I don't really feel it. So there's that. You have to overcome that somehow. But also just because you're getting bigger and stronger, what used to be the limit of your system 
is no longer the limit of your system. Yeah. Like 225 for 10 used to be a challenge. Now, if you say it's a challenge, you're fucking lying because you know you could do 15. So like, if you just stop at 10, you're like, yeah, it's fuck good, bro. Let's hit the showers, fellas. Like, yeah, shut the fuck up. You had five more reps. And it's like, okay, it's no longer in that limit. You yeah. need to do more. Yeah. So that's where the progressive term comes from. So progressive overload is really a long way of saying, how do we continue to make a challenge that leads to stimulus? And okay. Because load is part of that term, it got washed in there that it's weight. Yes. And weight is only one of the ways to stimulate the muscle growth. Weight has to be heavy enough to turn some shit on and get technical and what that means. It can't be so light that it doesn't robustly stimulate muscle growth anymore. Mm -hmm. And But there's not the only thing, uh, proximity to failure is a way to provide stimulus. Like if you do a real heavy weight, but you do it for two reps and you could have done it for six and you just leave, like that's not a, you're just showing off. There's not a whole lot of shit that happened. Repetitions are a way to present an increased stimulus. In an, a bit more of a nuanced understanding, the number of sets you're doing can be an increase in stimulus. And obviously the total amount of work you're doing and the work you've done beforehand. So if you used to bench, you're saying like, look, I can't go over 315 for reps in the bench because my fucking wrists hate me and my elbows hate me. How do I work around this? Well, you do flies beforehand or skull crushers beforehand, yeah. your muscles yeah. are pre-exhausted, and now that same 315 that fucks up your joints the same as it always, you're totally within line. You don't have to go bigger because used to be 315 for sets of 10, and you're like, I don't want to go any lighter. Now, after whatever flies, it sets a seven, and it's going to take you months, if not years, to work back up to sets of 10, and you'll be growing that entire time because the muscle that you take into that situation of benching through 15 is already pre-fatigued, it's pre-damaged, it's going to have to push itself to its limits, which will end at 315 for seven or eight or nine or 10. It won't end at 315 for 11, 12, 13, 14. So yeah. that principle still works. It's all about stimulus. And there are proxies for stimulus you can use. Like, am I getting a massive pump? Am I getting crazy sore? Do I feel a fuckload of tension in my muscle that I'm targeting? Do I feel the burn if I'm targeting the muscle? Those proxies you can use that you can kind of shit test yourself of like, well, I know like my weights are going up over time and so are my reps, but am I really pushing myself? Well, do you get mega pumps from your workout? Do you get tired and sore from your workout? Is the muscle weak? Imagine someone saying they fucked up their chest, like beyond belief. And you're like, okay, cool. What do you usually like machine fly? And they're like, I've done 260 for a set of eight. You're like, get on this machine fly real quick after your workout. You clip in 260, they hit eight. You're like, motherfucker, what? <laughs> you can't possibly have had a good chest workout. Now, yeah. if you clip 260 and it doesn't move and you clip a hundred and they grind it for three, okay, yeah, listen, 99 problems, but training hard is not one of them because some shit got out of your muscles that it's going to take days to get back yeah. proxies like that can reinforce whether or not you're really stimulating and you can get away from that strict mindset of overload means i add weight to the bar and if weight isn't getting added to the bar i'm fucking bitching out and my career is about to be over because i'm not progressing anymore but that's but that's exactly the point i want to make to because i feel like there's a group of intermediate lifters that know something but yeah. kind of sometimes when you know a little bit, but not a lot, it's like more dangerous, right? So it's For like, sure. yeah. I feel like they've taken this term progressive overload and I'm trying to emphasize the point that the stimulus, like you said, is more the entire workout, not just that one exercise. But, 100%. I, do, but I do know people that, I have had people on the podcast, I have friends that are like, they base their entire workout on that number. Did my did my bench increase by one pound? And if it didn't, then this was all a waste. Yeah. And I don't know if I, I just don't know if I agree with that. So I, I don't mean, know. You can feel confident in not agreeing with it because it's wrong. Um, are they coming from a good place? Definitely. Is that kind of thing really important in like powerlifting and strongman? Like, well, yeah, you can tell yourself all kinds of shit, but if you're not benching more and you're a bench presser in competition, like shit's not working. But you can absolutely use load as one of the variables you manipulate. Mm -hmm. And also, if the if the training is challenging in the proper way, it pushes you to your limits in roughly sets of five to 30 reps. Because if you go heavier than five, you're just showing off more than 30. The load isn't heavy enough to really grow some muscle. Like you don't see a lot of people doing sets of 100 straight reps and being like super jacked. But that's very uncommon. We've done a lot of research in exercise and sports science to show that after somewhere between 30 and 50 repetitions, there starts to be a fall off of how stimulative each hard set you do is, how much muscle it can grow. Mm -hmm. As long as you go five to 30 reps and you're getting close to failure, and the workouts are getting somehow more difficult over time. 
uh, often it's the load goes up or the repetitions go up or none of that happens but in in let's say the bench press but in dips before your load went up and your reps went up which makes every single time you come in and do dips then bench dips then bench because dips is getting you tired and more and more and more tired what is the same numbers hit on the bench at 315 for three <clears throat> for three by eight that is actually more okay. of a push to your limits and beyond so it actually is progressive overload so all you have to do is somehow over the long term make your workouts more challenging now that i will say is where that grain of truth comes back where if you go purely by feel mm -hmm. and you know because there was another movement you've been around for a while like in the early 90s there was guys that were like don't use heavy weights, make the weights heavy for the muscle. And that was like, okay, dope. I agree with that. That's cool. And yeah. then they're like really over indexed on the mind muscle shit where they've got like a 20 pound dumbbell and they're like, I can feel my biceps. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. But like, if you're not using some kind of heavier weight or higher reps up until 30, then you have to use heavier weight. If you're not getting real good stimulus for the long term, like months and years, you're just lying to yourself. And it's yeah. so easy to do because like when you're big and strong, a lot of stuff gets you a little bit of a pump and a lot of stuff is relatively impressive weight, but then it all just ends up being maintenance. And mm -hmm. the, here's the really crazy thing. It's something to nod to those folks that are into that progression idea. At some point to go from really jacked to mega fucking jacked, you will have to do some combination of more work, more reps, more load with stricter technique, whatever it is to really fuck yourself up. You will have to exit your comfort zone. So yeah. the idea that like, if you just ever only use 405, you may be able to get the biggest legs of all time, but there is a probability that the person who beats you on stage and has even bigger legs, you're like, dude, what's your secret? It's like, yeah, like I take, you know, 585 for a ride. And you're yeah. like, God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. And it, yeah, it's, at yeah. some point, like it has to be harder. Yeah. And because there's that 30 rep, roughly 30 rep cap of like, if you do more than sets of 30 reps, you're just kind of starting to joke around with yourself yeah. to some degree. You're going to have to put more load on the bar and there's no way to get around that. Okay. So a lot of things you touched on, um kind of sparked my interest so feeling and instinct uh do you agree that feeling and instinct can play a big part in training and the way i mean that is for example you use the you use the example of the kid that kim comes in and supposed to do four or five but decides he wants to do 385 instead mm -hmm. do you think that the way you feel that day matters uh, maybe you're not as hydrated. Maybe you didn't sleep as well. Maybe you had a rougher day at work before you came into the gym. Do you think all these exterior variables matter when it comes to feeling an instinct when you're in the gym training? 100%. Okay. So there is, so there is room then for somebody to say, yeah, I didn't do 405 today, but I exhausted the muscle in a different way. Yes, but it's a very tough situation because you have to consider just a few more things. One is, am I really in a position where I have to alter my training to get the best, safest workout? Or am I just being a little bitch? Because you know, you know, like it's in the real world, it's so tough to tell that apart at some point, yeah. Yeah. especially when you're like doing contest prep, for example, like, if you're on like, well, it's just like be just frank about the shit. You cool to talk about gear and shit like that? Yeah, yeah. Whatever you want to talk about. It's open. Great. When you're on enough gear, you can lift anything you need to lift. You can get the reps done. And in pre-contest, when the trend's hitting the blood, you're good for it. But you don't feel like you're good for it. You're tired. You're hungry. What the fuck modification are you supposed to make? Then you have to do a checklist in your head. Be like, okay, is me being tired unusual? Like, no, it's prep. I'm supposed to be tired. Okay, fine. That one goes away. Is me being hungry unusual? No, prep. That's supposed to be there. Did I have like a really rough day at work? Yes. But can I still hit my workout like planned? Yes. Thank you, Tran and Halo. So then you just get it done. So mm -hmm. there's an opportunity for you when you're feeling like, okay, maybe the shit's not good. There's a, a fork in the road and there are three ways you can go on that fork. Mm -hmm. One is to go, you know what? I'm still good for this shit. And you do the workout. Floyd, you ever had workouts where you come in and you're like, man, I'm not feeling this shit. And your workout, your, your training partner's like, dude, shut the fuck up. And you start warming up and you get the best fucking workout of your life and you fist pump yeah. after it. Thank you, bro. <laughs> like, yeah, I usually I usually tell myself to shut the fuck up. But yes. Yes. I, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, our yeah. own best training partner inside yeah. our heads. So yeah. 
So there's a pro- probability, and usually the answer is just shut up and do what the fucking program says. Yeah. There's another chance for you to go, you know what? Um, it's just not wise for me to go as heavy as I was going to go. Muscle stimulus has to occur. Yes. But like for heavy, I need hydration. I need stability. Sometimes like your legs are good for it, but like you did something at work where like your core is tired, your lower back is a little sore and you like have trouble even standing up, right? Like just normally, I just, you know, you're going to tweak your back. It's going to be months of fucking bullshit. Say, so, okay, I'm still here for it psychologically, but mechanistically, I need to back off on the load. Mm. Then you do what you said. You maybe replace exercises, change rep ranges, change the orders. You do more of a burnout type of thing, which works fucking great. And you can even do that week to week to week. Then, you know, if you're not feeling the burnout, what the fuck do you do? You sure shit don't go heavy. Then, you know, you just have to stick to the plan. So there's, you go as heavy as you planned. There's do burnout shit, which works super fucking well. And then there is another option, which most folks don't know about. And that is take a recovery session. And a recovery session is like half the weight for half the reps, half the sets. It's just a warm up that Mm -hmm. is like 15 minutes long. You push the blood through the muscles and it's been shown time and time again through scientific research that a little bit of training tends to on average recover you better and faster than no training at all, which is kind of trippy if you think about it, but it's just fucking true. That makes sense. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like you sit around all week watching TV, you'll recover, but like if you get in and move around a little bit, you recover faster. So instead of doing your fucking, let's say you do your train chest Monday and Thursday and Monday you come in and the shit's just fucking dilapidated. Like you're like, oh, I could do burnouts, but even that, I don't know if I can do justice to just take a recovery session. It's going to be the easiest thing in the world. And then by next Thursday, you're going to be so fucking recovered. You're going to be full again. Glycogen's going to be in your muscles. Everything's going to be healed. And you're going to hit that thing like a fucking war machine. So every now and again, just doing a recovery session, or if you don't want that complexity, just fucking leave the gym. Just don't go to the gym. There is a situation where, uh, so, so those, those are the three forks in the road. And we'll say that third fork is either take a recovery session or leave. So we could say it's four. Just just leave the gym, just drive to the gym, you're halfway there, like, nope, just go home, eat, sleep, relax, yeah, come yeah, back when, yeah. when it's time to hit it. Then there's take a recovery session, then there's go lighter, but use intensity techniques and my yeah. reps, metabolites, drop sets, exercise order changes, higher reps. Then there is just stick to the fucking plan. All of those are valid options in particular situations. The challenging thing for the bodybuilder, and this is where coaching can come in handy, and the app is like, when am I just tucking my tail between my legs for no good reason? And Mm. when am I just making an actually really good decision that is going to end up doing me justice in the long term? And I will Mm. say one more thing. Uh, especially at a high level. I imagine a lot of the folks listening to your podcast are aspiring to be higher level bodybuilders or themselves already high level level folks. Um, You can't have mediocre workouts. Mm Mm-hmm. Mediocre leads to maintenance at the expense of fatigue. Like it was just enough to make you tired to make your elbows hurt, but not enough to get into that range of systemic limit to push you into that stimulus and give you actual muscle growth over time. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those things where it's like, um, if I'm going to work out, it is either going to be a dedicated recovery session or it's going to be hell with high reps and drop sets, or it's going to be hell with my pre-programmed heavy loads, etc. cetera. Yeah. I can't go into the gym and sort of just do an okay workout. It's much harder than a recovery session because recovery session is like half of everything, half the weight, half the reps, half the sets. Like that's easy as fuck. It can't be this. I'll put you this way. There's no C plus efforts in, in high level bodybuilding. It's yes. just no place for it at all. So either you off or you're taking it easy or you're frying yourself or you're loading yourself up like crazy. Mm-hmm. There is not and the in between is what a lot of people end up being. And I'm here to tell you guys who are the fucks listening, don't go in between. You either go easy as fuck or take the day off or go hard in some way that you know. Um, and a lot of people, man, in between is kind of what your body, your mind is telling you to do. It's like, hey, just go in there and do something. Challenge yourself a little bit. If you're jacked and, sh- and strong enough, challenging a little bit is no longer an option. You got to get in there and get it or it's not going to work. It's like the shit, shit analogy I can come up with off the top of my head is like, you have like, let's say you're single, hypothetically. I'm not single. I don't know if you're single. I'm married. I'm there you go. Same here. So yeah. back in the day, right? It's like if 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 like you get a DM, a DM we didn't do DMs back in the day, right? You get a text, <laughs> no. right? Maybe a phone call, a fucking carrier pigeon a drops beeper. off a fucking letter. Yeah, beeper. A page, a like, page. Yeah, nope, this is my drug dealing beeper. I got to get the other one. Beeper for hoes. Um, you know, so you, let's say you get a beep, right? Yeah. And it's like if 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 she's like, hey, like, what are you doing tonight? LOL. You know, some shit like clearly de- down down to do shit. Yeah. I- imagine that like she's three hours one way drive away. 
Mm-hmm. Are you going there for some mediocre shit? No, you're the fucking man. You got bitches around. You get mediocre shit today. You get it from your hand right now in five minutes. Yeah. yeah. It's got to be either you don't go or it's going to be like tantric, amazing, psychotic fucking sex that you're like, I should. I don't know if that's true, Mike. I don't know if that's true, Mike. Fuck that, bro. I'm I might drive go, eight hours for mediocre. I might, <laughs> I might go just to get anything and then just come home. My man. <laughs> but like, you no. know, <laughs> let's pretend we get laid often. Yeah. Like it, it, there's a certain amount. Or okay, fuck, fine, Fuad, you, you beat me. You beat me You know, anywhere <laughs> around the world for pussy. Fine. Like a restaurant that's really good. Yeah. People like, oh, this great place. Yeah. But it's in it's in downtown Toronto and you live in like Hamilton and you're yeah. like, how good is it? Because it's like one does not simply I can see the Toronto skyline from here, yeah. but like I know it's an hour and a half in traffic. So this yeah. place better be fucking good. Yeah, That's yeah, it. Yeah. Your workout is either fucking good or it's a super, super light and easy or you just don't go. Don't go into that in, in between place. I guess the 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 most important thing I'm taking for that, because my impression and, and I'm sorry if this is this is my own fault for not doing more research, but my impression of a lot of progressive overload and i put you in that category and i should put me in any category man just spill that I just, shit i don't I get just, offended. Uh, i always thought there was zero flexibility because the people that i've spoken to that are of the progressive overload camp even though i, I all of a sudden don't like that term anymore after you've kind of broadened the the horizon on it but sure. um the people that are in that camp have no flexibility like this is my logbook. this is what i have to do if i don't do with my logbook, then uh, it's all just a fucking waste of time. And what you've just explained is kind of what I've always thought. And and I've always told people like to learn as much about training as possible, because you have to have as many tools in your toolbox as possible for the days when you aren't able to go crazy so that you can do a, so that you can do uh, all the drop sets and, and burnout sets and all that. Cause you can't do your regular thing. Yep. The one thing I didn't expect you to say is, to take the active recovery day because now this conflicts with well you're just being a bitch so how does the person know if they're being a bitch or if they deserve the active recovery day one it helps to have a coach two it helps to um have wisdom which is just accumulated knowledge and understanding over the years and uh, a shortcut to some wisdom is to you know, read the hypertrophy book or go on youtube and watch our videos about all the shit there are some indicators of fatigue um, if anyone wants to do a deep dive you just google fatigue indicators and what they mean or whatever and it's an article my uh colleague james hoffman and i wrote a while back still very valid there is some other shit that's going to be present if you actually have fatigue in the measurable scientific sense and some of these things won't be present. So for example, did you have a really bad night of sleep last night? Mm. Was your nutrition really fucked up? Were you under a lot of external stress? Like, let's say like you and a girlfriend have been like literally arguing and, you know, throwing plates at each other all night. Yeah. Typical, typical yeah. argument. Um, that's a lot of huge, <laughs> not, nothing. I don't throw plates. I don't throw, I throw them up. Oh, there you go. Whew, that's a little heavier. So, um, if if you have a demonstrable good reason that your level of fatigue is excessively high and needs to be brought down, like you haven't been sleeping well, haven't been eating well, your actual internal desire to train is is really low. And a low desire to train means something very specific. It's not it's not specific to the modality. So if you're like, man, you know, I don't want to do bench press today, but I definitely would want to do like some kind of like cardio shit or some kind of lighter weights, higher reps. You don't have a lower desire to train. You're just fucking bitching out of the plan. Yeah. Yeah. You need a compelling reason. Here's another compelling reason. The last time you benched heavy, your, your joints fucking really hurt. And you're like three weeks out of a show. And you're like, if I bench heavy, I know my joints are going to hurt and it might fuck me up big time, big time. I don't need that in my life. So it has to be good objective reasons that your physical system is somehow so fucked that you are not able to bring yourself into that stimulus range dependably or safely. If you just, so you have to search your mind, search your feelings, Jedi style, and think about what else is going on in my life that have earned this. Now, let's say you have been getting good sleep. Let's say you have been eating really fucking well. Let's say your fucking gear is hitting the blood and you're feeling like a fucking real man, et cetera. And then you show up to the gym and you look at the weight and it's like heavy, you know, like 
we're strong enough at this point where like you load enough weights onto the squat rack and the bar actually starts to bend inside the rack like no one's touching it but it's bending yeah. you look at it you're like that's steel what the fuck like i don't want to be in there with that thing like if it's bending steel what is it going to do to my bones yeah. then if there's no good reason and you're just not feeling it just generally i'd say nine times out of ten just shut the fuck up and go but there's even better advice to give so just start warming up yeah start warming up huge deal because if you're going to take a recovery session you still have to do the warm-up no love lost if you do a high rep low weight session burnouts and drop sets you still have to warm up no love lost and if you're going to do that session that you had planned which is maybe a pretty heavy you still have to warm up a lot of times in my experience athletes will come into the gym and they'll have that general they'll check all the boxes and be like i'm not technically overtrained or overreached i'm not even in a state of high fatigue i just don't feel it today mm-hmm. no worries most of them after a few warm-up sets they start nodding their head like yeah fuck yeah, yeah fuck yeah or yeah. after a few warm sets they're like i don't know this feels fucked up my best advice try what's called a potentiation set which is you take your working weight out let's say you had planned for eight to 12 do it for two to four reps see how Mm -hmm. it feels Mm -hmm. because sometimes it'll be like well that was fucking terrible my joints hurt it was awful then yeah let's fucking pivot and go do high reps or just do recovery and get the fuck out but sometimes you do like two to four reps and you're like yeah fuck yeah this shit's fucking happening today you didn't feel it early now you do so it's like yeah try it you know like your friends will send you to summer camp and you're like i don't want to go to camp and you're crying like just try it and if you really hate it we'll come pick you up after a week right warm up into the shit a lot of nine times out of ten once you warm up you either have clarity on what you're supposed to be doing or you know exactly what you're supposed to be doing because it was the plan you had written all along yeah i uh it's funny you said that because usually the first the very first warm-up like let's say i'm doing chest or something if i just Mm -hmm. to take the bar off the rack Mm -hmm. with like a plate just to warm up Mm -hmm. i can feel it from the first three four reps i'm like it feels really smooth or it feels like complete dog shit sure so it's like, yeah, you could, that's a, that's really good advice. Cause I can, uh, I've never thought of that. I've never thought of like, you know what, just try out a little bit. Cause for me, it's like, yeah. once I start, I start, once sure. I start, I'm going to finish. Sure. So it's like, <clears throat> I've never thought of, Hey, you can kind of start. And if it doesn't feel right, you can do something else. I have, however, thought I have gone in there and thought, okay, today's going to be a heavy day. And then after my warm up, have pivoted to, uh, no, it's going to be a lighter weight, a higher volume day. With yeah. more with more intensity techniques, but I've never thought to just leave or take an active rest. Yeah. Um, the just leaving is tough psychologically because you're like, I feel like I'm giving up. But right. um, you know, like if you talk to like great you know American generals in battle or some shit in World War II, you resurrected the zombie generals, and you're like, like remember when you made that strategic retreat and you walked away from the Nazis? And they're like, yeah, like, did you feel bad about it? They'd be like, well, yeah, but like, you don't want to lose the whole war because you're too big of an egotistical idiot and burn all your troops to the ground. A strategic retreat is an intelligent thing to do and you come back and hit it. It's like chronicled to the history of war. Like the retreat doesn't mean losing. It means you're smart enough to know when to back the fuck up. So if you're like one of these guys, here's the thing is there takes a little bit of insanity to be a good bodybuilder. Like none of us are really fucking normal because if we're in there physically hurting ourselves for something, yeah. But you got to be a little sane and be like, okay, am I just here because like my dad mistreated me when I was little and I just got to get a lot of pain out, which, you know, like, hey, dope. That's that's part of the process. That's why I'm, I'm in there. But um, or am I in here to try to get the biggest fucking muscles on the leanest on the stage as possible? Mm-hmm. And if the second thing is what I really want and I know that right now I'm not going to be able to have a very effective workout, all of the actual signs of fatigue are very high. My physical body is fatigued. Any good coach would be higher like Matt Jansen or something something you tell him he's gonna be like dude take half a week of easy fucking training or no training at all eat a bunch of food here's your new macros and then come back and we'll fucking hit it that has to be a part of your plan uh just like eye lasering the shit out of your equipment and being like fucking grind bro 24 7 never give up like you can do that but if you're fatigued enough four weeks out of a show and you try that shit you're gonna show up like i did at my last show soft as fuck watery as shit embarrassing and people are gonna be like oh like what happened you're like i never gave up like wow holy shit slow clap amazing but if you gave up for three days and let everything go back to normal you could have fucking been 50 times better never mind the fact that you can get injured continually pushing when you know you shouldn't i mean injuries you know like you pop a peck like you're not the same ever on a bodybuilding stage so don't fuck around with that shit and the interesting thing is one really quick thing while i'm ranty um 
In bodybuilding, the judges do not get a scorecard that includes your rep maxes or how tough you were. They don't give a fuck. They care about how you look. And if it's more important for you to hold your feet to the fire, to injure yourself doing weights you shouldn't be doing because you're too fatigued, dope. Nobody cares. But if you back up when you have to and train smart, do some higher reps every now and again and put the best package on stage, they're like, here's your first place trophy. And you're like, you take the microphone. You're like, gotta be honest, fellas. I don't want to accept this. And they're like, why? Like, I didn't work as hard as I could have this mess cycle. They're like, what the <laughs> fuck is wrong with you? You take a trophy and get out of here, dummy. I, uh, I, I do want to stick up for the meatheads a little bit though, because I consider myself one of those guys. Same here. Yeah. When I, when I, um, so I endured a lot of injuries in my career and I was, I never really understood the pullback, uh, mentality because I, I thought, to be better, you just got to go harder. Mm -hmm. If you're not good enough, you got to go harder. Mm -hmm. And all I was digging, I was just digging myself a deeper and deeper hole. Mm -hmm. And I think, <clears throat> I think it's hard when you're in the state of getting ready for a contest to allow yourself to relax. Because I think if you think, you know, especially when you're six weeks out, you're like, oh man, there's six weeks. You've counted the days. You've counted the hours. You know exactly how long it's going to be till you get on stage. Mm -hmm. You're like, man, I got to make every day count. Yep. So I think if you take you look a at your glutes in the mirror and you're like, yeah, I'm not there yet. And I right. sure shit won't be fucking disappointed on, on the day. So let me cut right. my carbs even more. Let me fucking push even right. harder. Right. So I, I don't, I don't fault people for thinking that way because it's very hard to think I got to get better. And that means I got to relax. Yeah. Even though it's, John, like, I don't know, you, you knew John Meadows well, no? I, I, I knew him. I had conversations with him on the phone. Yeah. So yeah, well enough. Yeah. So John used to tell me, uh it's good to dig yourself a hole but don't dig yourself a hole so deep that you can't crawl out of it yeah and to me it was the best analogy ever because that's how my before i met john that was how my training mentality was just I, dig. I needed to be sore for a week and if i mm -hmm. wasn't sore for a week then i didn't go hard enough mm -hmm. and john taught me like no you got to be sore for like three days two days right Dude, so i at my two shows ago I did Masters USA's. I was a super heavyweight, just barely. I weighed in at like 225.4 or some shit. And I had like decent glutes. I took second in the class. It was like pretty dope. I was like, all right, sweet. Masters USA, second in the class, not bad. Yeah. This past show that I had in July, I did Masters Nationals. I was in the heavyweights this time. And a few other things I did that were stupid, but um, I took fifth and I looked like just fucking worse, just straight up worse. Right. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways I got to looking worse was um i pushed so hard i wasn't even like it was difficult for me to walk around for six weeks and get the twelve thousand steps my my legs were that heavy Sorry, yeah. and uh, all the time fatigued yeah. like crazy and i was able to eat way fewer calories than i should have been mm -hmm. here's here's another thing you know people say like you got to get flat to get lean yeah what they really mean is you got to get flat every now and again, every week or two, and then take another week or two to refill and then go yeah. into it again, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was completely flat for the last nine weeks of that's prep. The, just, that's the worst thing you can That's do. it. Yeah. Like I yeah. just lost muscle and my body was like, I'm not going to lose any more fat because fuck you. I'm going to die yeah. here in a bit. So fuck that. And yeah. I just ended up looking like shit. And I was like, what was different about my last prep versus this prep? It was a few other things, but one of them was I pushed and pulled in my last prep. In this prep, I had that fucking mentality, bro. Like I just got to fucking go. You know, yeah. like I'm from immigrant parents and shit. Like we didn't come to America to fuck around. Like we push yeah. Yeah. and like, it's easy to get that mentality and forget that the body's a system that is physical and it needs to be taken care of you're growing the body you're not destroying it the destruction stimulates the growth but if you don't give yourself rest and food and an occasionally much lower stress environment those adaptations don't occur as well your body ideally likes to grow muscle and lose fat in a low stress environment the stress should be very high in the workout and then easy the rest of the time you add cardio you add lower calories to that and then it just bleeds you out and you've got to refill every now and again stress as my my uh, my friend broderick Chavez and one of my uh, consultants slash coaches said recently, like stress is the great killer of physiques. Yeah. So if you're going in and you can tell too, like there's this mythology of what you should feel like coming into a show and there's what the top guys actually do. And it's fucking different, bro. You've been yeah. around this. I'm sure yeah. where people like you got to fucking suffer. And like people will like say, oh, backstage, like you're hungry, you're fucking tired. It's hard to hit your poses. Who's winning the show? 
it's these motherfuckers that are like loving life and fucking hitting transitions, winking yeah. at the camera. Like, what the fuck's up with that guy? Like, didn't he dehydrate? Isn't he fatigued? Like, no, he dropped all his fatigue two weeks ago. No, he's not dehydrated. He's just a little bit dehydrated under his skin, super full in the muscles. That's who's fucking winning is the guys. And there's actually direct scientific evidence of this shit yeah. where they took natural, admittedly natural bodybuilders, but the principles are all the fucking same. You can only outgear yeah. so much shit. Yeah. And shit like trend actually causes more stress in some respects and yeah. it helps. You're not sleeping anymore, et cetera. Yeah. They, they actually took a look at who placed at the higher level in bodybuilding the same shows and at the lower level. And they took, took a look at differences. And one of the differences, the guys who placed better, who were leaner, actually ate more food on average coming into prep. Yep. And yep. when I read that, I was like, what the fuck? Like, because like for what I think to you and I, it's like, like you said something earlier, which was like, I, if I just go like, harder that will fix all of my problems right yes. dude if only if, if it was that simple you'd be mr olympia and i'd be second place mm -hmm. because like i'm not i'm not gonna quit ever yeah. fuck that like yeah. i can die in the shit i don't care but it's not that's not the ticket the ticket's to push yourself and when you're ready to break back the fuck up eat more take a little easier time then come back in and it's multiple inroads into that that get you that physique that you want and it's just shit i'm just telling myself to comfort me from having a mega fucking loss you know crying no no you're right listen i do think i do think there's definitely a place for suffering and i do think there's a place for um being extremely Feeling. hung being extremely <laughs> yeah. hungry and all yeah, that yeah. but it, but because I don't want people to get the wrong idea and be like, oh, it should be easy. Like, no, there's a ton of like suffering that goes into it. But the pulling back part is the part that I think you said you missed in your last prep and I Huge. missed in many preps. And like going to your point, the two shows I think I looked at my absolute best ever in my career was one with John, the first, the uh, Orlando Pro I did with John uh, and then the Flex Pro I did with Hani. And both coaches had me eating more were more relaxed and were kind of like monitoring my training. So I wasn't going overboard Damn. in what I was doing. And so it, it does make sense. Um, the one thing I, I did want to uh, say is um, we were going to, you were touching on how hard you would go on the diet. The funny thing is I always understood that when it came to food, I needed to pull back, but I didn't understand that in training. Like I always under, I always understood the methodology of the body, meaning I've depleted it and I got to fill it back up. I've depleted mm -hmm. it and I got to fill it back. I always got that part, but for some reason it never translated to training. Cause I always thought training just meant go as crazy yep. as you can all the time. Yep. So, Fuck man. I got it on either. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing is I did that one year. Uh, there was one year where I did that with a coach I will, who remain nameless where we you know you placed well when they remain nameless <laughs> no i didn't do bad i think i was i think i was third i was third that year uh but um we basically did no carbs and no fats for about 10 weeks yeah i've done and that not, and not only does that strip away muscle during your prep but it also becomes almost impossible to load up come showtime yeah like i don't know how you felt when during your the show, same like, it took me a week and a half to load up afterwards yeah. Yeah. i couldn't load up for the show yeah. i just like i ate more food and i looked flatter because my body's yeah. finally starting to relax and it's like oh jesus i'm not gonna die and you just look worse you're like what yeah. the fuck yeah yeah because yeah, i noticed if you don't keep that glycogen your glycogen store is kind of topped up every once in a while mm -hmm. they become almost impossible to fill at the end yeah, yeah. so um i wanted to touch on pump chasing because mm -hmm. you mentioned a couple things about pump, and I always thought a lot of scientists didn't value the pump. And mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know where I got that impression, but it's the impression I had. Because a lot of people call it pump chasing, as in like it's a waste of time. Yeah. But I always gauged a lot of my training. I mean, yes, the strength mattered, but only to a certain degree. Because I feel like you can only get so strong. Um, I gauge a lot of my workouts by how my pump was. Is that wrong when people do that? It's actually very wise, and I'll tell you exactly how the exercise science people that uh, said the pump doesn't matter or you're wasting your time got that idea. And it was actually from a logical fallacy that something like um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. So just because there was no formal scientific evidence linking the pump to growth doesn't mean that the pump doesn't cause growth. It could have meant that, but it could also have meant it does cause growth, but we just haven't actually studied it yet. It's not like there were reams of studies that said, look, we measured people's pumps, 
and they have nothing to do with growth outcomes. Mm -hmm. So you're fucking literally wasting your time, which could have been a thing, you know, like when your dick pumps up, it doesn't grow your fucking dick. You know, like that would be like, oh, trying to get 10 boners a day because sooner or later, it'll, it'll just be my normal dick that looks like that. Someone's like, dad, I'm, unfortunately, you're wasting your time. I tried that. It's called when I was 15 years old. It didn't work. So it could be just that it didn't work. But when we actually started researching it, which was very recently, just a few years ago, now there are a few studies that directly show that the people in a research study, that in, even in session one, get the best pumps, grow the most. Okay. And there is also mechanistic data showing that actual cell swelling, when the cell is pulled apart by its own contents being at high pressure, mm -hmm. that actually causes muscle growth to switch on. Okay. Another thing is when you get a big pump, how do you get a big pump? You got to do a few things right. One, you have to be actually stimulating the target muscle. How the fuck do you get a pump in your chest if you're benching wrong and it's all shoulders and triceps? It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So when you're getting a big pump in a muscle, you know some shit is going on in that muscle for sure. So the targeting, the mind-muscle connection, it has to be there for a big pump to occur. Next, what are there some other ingredients of a good pump? You got to get close to failure. How the fuck are you going to get the best pump of your life not getting close to failure? One thing I don't understand is like, especially before shows, guys will use like these bullshit bands and do like a set of five and then rest and do a set of five. And they're like, yeah, man, I'm getting a fucking big shoulder pump. Like, no, you're not, motherfucker. You're just moving your arms around. The best pump you could possibly get, you got to go close to failure. And some guys who are like maybe former sprinters or NFL football players, they're more fast twitch muscles. They actually get their best pumps from like relatively heavy shit, like sets of five, sets of 10, sets of 15. On average, people get their best pumps from sets of 10 to 20. Some people will get their best pumps from sets of 20 to 30. But in my experience, if you go way light, like sets of 25, your pump isn't even that good because yeah. you're just kind of moving the weight around. It's like, do you get a big pump doing cardio and walking? You're like, no, like, but it's a lot of reps, like it's the reps that matters. You have to get a little heavy, at least push your muscles close to failure. And it's not usually just going to take one set, like your best pump in your quads is after like, I don't know a few sets of some shit, maybe yeah. four to six or four to eight sets, then you get your best pump. Yeah. If we're checking all those boxes on our way to getting a pump, the pump ends up being an amazing proxy for we're getting a fucking great workout. Sure. And never in my life have I gotten a fucking unbelievable pump and not gotten sore and fatigued in that muscle for at least a few days after it's never happened so much. So sorry, go ahead. Fun. No, 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 I didn't. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just I just thought of because I've had discussions with people that thought I don't, they've actually literally said to me, I don't care about the pump because if I'm getting stronger, I'm growing. Yeah. And I don't, and, and they said, I can, I, I'm going to get a pump indirectly. And I'm like, yes, that's true. If I, if I squat 500 for six reps and I do mm -hmm. like five reps, five sets of that, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a pump in my legs. Mm -hmm. But if I leave that exercise and finish it and go do walking lunges for 30 yards with a hundred pound bar on my back, mm -hmm. my pump is going to be 10 times greater. Mm -hmm. So I feel like there's not enough emphasis put on it by some people because yeah. I want to like my, my objective when I go to the gym is to yes, lift the heaviest I can lift within, you know, a certain rep range. But if I don't have a like an excruciating pump when I leave, I feel like my workout wasn't as good as it could have been. Or I don't want to yeah. say a waste, but wasn't yeah. as good as it should have been. So there are multiple mechanisms of hypertrophy and there are multiple proxies of if you're not, you're eliciting hypertrophy, eliciting muscle growth. Providing a crap load of tension is kind of never the wrong answer. And if you're getting stronger over time for reps at a sufficient volume, then you're almost certainly growing. Sure. The problem is, is neither the pump nor rep strength is an one-to-one -one indicator of growth. Mm -hmm. So in my experience, you probably want as many indicators as possible. Uh, I want to be able to have the highest probability uh, of knowing that what I just did actually worked. Mm -hmm. So not only do I want some rep PRs at really heavy loads, I also want to have a really big pump. If I have both, the probability that I'm not growing as much muscle as possible is very small. Sure. If I have just one, I'm well on my way. If I have zero, I don't know what it is I'm doing in the gym. So guys that are only focused on the numbers, there are ways in which if they do enough volume and they push close to failure and hit their PRs, they're definitely growing muscle too. But nine times out of 10, they'll also have a really great pump from that. Sure. There are ways, however, to train in the gym and to check some of the boxes but not actually cause a lot of muscle growth. For example, 
let's say you hit a big PR for one set of eight, huge all-time PR, it's 20 more pounds than you've ever squatted. And then you did like a set of leg extensions after, you got a little bit of a pump and you're like, that's good enough. I hit my PR, that's muscle growth. Hold on a second. That's not enough stimulus. It's not a volume to grow a ton of muscle. You're actually just showing off. Mm -hmm. And even over the long term, you say, dude, I train like this, do sets of five, sets of three. My strength is going up, dope. But strength comes from largely two factors. One is how big your muscles are. And two, how advanced is your nervous system at taking your muscles and actually pushing them to their limits. Mm -hmm. Power lifters are often way stronger than bodybuilders because their muscles are the same size or usually smaller, mm -hmm. but their nervous systems are so well-trained from a lot of that low repetition, low volume, heavyweight lifting that they get stronger because their nervous system is improving. But as bodybuilders, we don't need that shit because nobody gives a fuck what your nervous system is like on stage. There's no weights for you to lift. It's not 1920 where they did like some weightlifting and then some posing yeah. It's just posing. So if you go in and you go, I'm going to go hard and heavy and I'm going to get stronger over time. And I know that's going to cause muscle growth. You're probably right, but there's a chance that you're wrong. If you go too heavy and do too low of a volume, you get too focused on getting just strong. You may not be providing enough volume, enough proximity to failure. And those two things are really the critical key of muscle growth. And if you say to yourself, well, if I do provide those, what's going to happen? Nine times out of 10, you're also going to fuck an amazing pump. So what I would say is this, just chasing the pump is usually good enough. And if you only monitor pumps, you'll get amazing muscle growth. But the combination is probably the best yes. where you get your pumps by increasing the amount of load or reps in predictable exercises week to week to week until you deload and take it easy, I'll change the exercises and go back again. So if you're going in the gym to just do random shit, and get amazing pumps, you'll get you get great results, but maybe not your best. You yeah. get your best results by getting fucking psychotic pumps from shit that's a little bit more reps or weight every single week for a few weeks straight. That's how you check both boxes of progression and pump. And that's that's how I would do it. There's also yeah. like is it the right muscle that's being hit? Because sometimes, you know, you want to pump on your biceps and you do curls, you just get a big forearm pump and you're like, yeah, I got a pump, but it's not the right thing. There's also another thing of perceiving tension in the, in the proper muscle. Um, people do lunges for their glutes. They do them in a way that just hits their quads. You're like, oh my God, my quads are pumped to shit, but my glutes don't feel much. Someone, a lot of quote unquote exercise science people be like, doesn't matter mechanistically your glutes have to get hit because of the arrangement of fibers in the exercise. Like, that's not true, man. You can lean one way or another, and all of a sudden, another muscle mostly takes over. So, yeah. if you get a pump in your glutes, you know you're onto some shit. You know, after you do some, you haven't done lunges in a while, you do a set or two of lunges, and you have to start waddling around. Someone's yeah. like, why don't you walk faster? You're like, if I walk faster, one of my glutes would cramp and I would fall down. You know, you did some shit to that glute. Yeah. You yeah. know, muscle growth is coming. So, there's those yeah. other signs as well, not just a pump. It's another really quick thing. If you have enough glycogen in your in your body and you're well rested, you ate like a thousand grams of carbs for two days straight, and you're on like you know like four D ball tabs or some shit like that, you can get a fucking pretty big pump. Yeah. Not doing a lot of work, you're mostly just you're warming right. up, and then yeah. the pump no longer tells you that you're growing. It's just like cool. Yeah. So there are other things you have to exhaust the muscle to a relative degree. You're like I said earlier, your chest has to be tired and weaker. Yeah. You try to walk down the stairs out of the gym and you just train quads and your quads feel wobbly. Like they're not your legs. That's a fucking great sign. You got to be able to check mark that you fucked some shit up. The yeah. pump is a part of that. Strength progression is a part of that. I would say a third big part of that is you got fucked up, which is measured basically in like two or three ways. One, you strength loss in the muscle right after. Two is what we call like perturbation, which is like you get crampy, the muscle feels weird, you try to brush your teeth after a bicep workout, and you can't even poke the toothbrush in the right spots. And lastly is what's called disruption. And that's like either the day after you feel tight or hopefully a few days later you feel sore. Mm -hmm. If you check all of those boxes and you're eating well and taking the right supplements, you have to grow. There's no way around it. But if you leave some of them unchecked, maybe you grew, maybe you didn't. I just yeah. want to make sure I check as many boxes as I can. Yeah, yeah no, I really like that. I, I really like the way uh, you put that because Brad Schoenfeld was on the podcast for and he kind of mentioned the same thing. But there's, there's three different parts to muscle growth i just don't like it when people see this entire this entire podcast has been very nuanced and not one thing is the absolute sure. i mean there are some absolutes but there are also more things to the equation i think that's what people keep forgetting is it's not one thing or the other it's an entire like it's a piece of, it's a piece of a puzzle really um oh yeah but i wanted to touch on uh soreness because some people say soreness is not an indicator of growth. 
And I don't know if it is or isn't, but I've always taken it as one. I've always taken it as if I do work out and the next day I don't feel sore at all or the day after that, I feel like something wasn't right. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I, I don't know if I want to hundred percent hinge my progress based on that, but it was always an indicator for me. Is that something that's a myth or is that true? I have a take on this that is different than a lot of the other folks of my educational level that you will talk to. And I think I'm right. And I think with all due respect that they're wrong. <laughs> and my, my take is the following that if you're not sure if you're pushing your muscles hard enough, you're not sure if you're doing enough volume, for example, enough sets, and you're also not reliably getting sore, you should probably try to do more work to see if you can get sore. Mm -hmm. If you're not getting sore in a muscle, but you're getting great progress compared to the other muscles in your body, you actually don't have to get sore to get good growth. We know that you don't have to get sore okay. to get amazing growth. You can get great growth without soreness. But if you're not getting great growth and you're also not getting sore, there's a little bit of an indicator there that you may not be doing enough. So try to do a little bit more. And third part, if you are reliably getting sore and healing just on time for your training again, that same muscle, training harder will not help you because you're already pushing the system to its limits. If someone was like, you're not training legs hard enough and you sat them down and you're like, check this out. I train my quads on Monday and Thursday. After the Monday session, I'm sore Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday morning, I'm barely healed to do yeah. quads again. Yeah. Then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm sore as fuck. And Monday, next Monday, I'm barely healed to do it again. Do you think I should do more work? And they're like, yeah, what the, f what, how? So you want to be sore during workouts too? There's a yeah. lot of reasons why that's a fucking stupid idea. Yeah. So it turns out like if you do get sore in a muscle, timing it so that you heal just on time can tell you reliably, this is probably the most growth you're in for. And yeah, 99 problems, muscle growth is uh, training difficulty is not one of them. Yeah. If you're not getting sore, but you're growing and you're getting progress, you're getting stronger, your pecs are visibly bigger, no worries. You can try to train harder and get sore and maybe there'll be something there. Or you can try to get uh, training hard and get sore and you'll actually just over or overreach a little bit, overtrain, the muscle will get tired. Maybe it was too much. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you aren't getting progress, also you aren't getting amazing pumps in that muscle. You feel like I'm doing three sets of leg curls. If that's supposed to be what's good for hamstrings. I never really get much of a pump. I'm not getting sore in my hamstrings. Should I do more? The answer is, yeah, you should probably do more. So soreness is a little complicated in the sense it's not a definite indicator, but in some situations, it's more definite. In some situations, it's like, well, it's kind of dealer's choice. Yeah. So people that say soreness means nothing are fucking wrong. So, well, it's, you know, that's a common thing you'll get in the evidence-based fitness industry. They'd be like, soreness is like an illusion, doesn't matter, it's all the result of novelty. That novelty thing is dumb as fuck because what else do we know about novelty? How do you, how do you grow so much when you're in your first six months of training? It's fucking novelty. Novelty is a good thing on average. Yeah. Soreness tracks very well to progress mm -hmm. in that situation. So soreness isn't meaningless, but soreness is also not the end-all be-all. Sure. So just to resimplify all that shit, if you have a struggling muscle group that's not growing and you're not getting sore, I would try to do more and try to get sore. What is the things that get us the most sore? Novelty, which we already know grows muscle, slowing down, controlling the eccentric, which we have tons of data that shows it grows muscle, getting closer to failure, doing more work, focusing more on the mind muscle connection, improving your technique. That's all shit that grows muscle. It's not an accident that it also causes soreness. I think yeah. soreness and muscle growth have nothing to do with each other. You got to answer for like 10 things that correlate one to one in soreness and muscle growth. That's not yeah. all the things, but that's a lot of things. Yeah. So yeah. if you're not progressing and you're not getting sore, I would try to get sore. If you're progressing and you're not getting sore, dealer's choice. I would just leave well enough alone. But mm -hmm. if you want to push a little bit more of the pace, see if you can get a little more summer of progress, great. And lastly, if you are getting reliably sore, training harder is definitely the wrong answer. Um, any harder than that would be really stupid. And you can probably rest assured that you're training hard enough. The rest of it's going to be food, supplements, and genetics and time. Mm. So let's say, just to touch on that a little bit further, let's say you I'll take your example of the Monday, Thursday leg training thing. Mm -hmm. let's say you um you want to train harder but you're like you said you're already like maxed out you're sore till the day it's you're ready to go again 
is there a way to combat that? Like, let's say somebody says, you know what, I'm going to try eating more. I'm going to try taking different supplements. I'm going to try taking more gear. Let's say they do these other variables and they speed up their recovery so that they're less sore the day before now. And they, mm-hmm. they, their, their, their soreness has gone, gone away a day before leg day. Mm-hmm. Can they now go harder? Like is, so are you completely, yep. are you completely measuring your output in the gym based on how sore you are and your frequency? Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. It's not just soreness. There's also the element of fatigue. Like, am I strong enough to hit PRs and actually have a good session? Because you might not have delayed onset soreness in your muscle, but like you try to use your quads and they're just fucking tired, you know, and that's no good. You have to eat more and rest more so that they're ready to go. So it's two things, soreness and and they're ready to go and they're just like feeling really good. If those two things occur earlier because of some intervention, like you ate more, you slept more, you took more drugs, Absolutely, you can either increase your frequency, train more often with the same difficulty, or increase the difficulty of training that you're causing a bigger stimulus, but you now have bought yourself an extra day to heal from more damage and thus get more growth. Absolutely 100%. The the real kicker is there's another category of interventions that mask or reduce soreness but at the expense of growth. So one fun trick you can use is you go to the gym, you have a fucking unbelievable workout. Let's say it's your quads. Then you go and you get into an ice bath for 30 minutes or some shit like that, 10 Mm. minutes, whatever. Mm. Cooling the muscle, uh, any kind of ice cryotherapy, it's called generally, actually results in you getting less sore. Like you will never get crazy delayed onset soreness that's like difficult to take a shit, you know what I mean? Yeah. you're not, you're never going to get that. It's going to be mild soreness, kind of diffuse. And then after a couple of days, it goes away completely. And you may think like, dude, what the fuck? We've been sleeping on this fucking ice bath. Your boy's getting in the ice after every fucking workout. I'm just going to train every other fucking day because yeah. the ice has got me, right? <laughs> fucking Mr. Freeze out here. Yeah. And then you look at the research and it's like the same processes of immune system infiltration into the muscle that caused you to have that delayed onset soreness are also shut down and reduced by icing. Okay. But they're also the ones that grow muscle. So you're, so you're like, oh, yeah. fuck. Yeah. And study after study after study, heat therapy, cold therapy, both cause a reduction in, in muscle soreness and a reduction in hypertrophy and muscle growth if you do them after training. The best possible thing you can do after training is go the fuck home, sit the fuck down, eat a big ass meal of carbs and protein and chill the fuck out. And then later that night, sleep, you know, take whatever number of units of growth gets you to that sleeping place, fucking go to sleep, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. There's that Sarah Stim smile I like to see. But uh, <laughs> it's a genotropin smile, shut up. <laughs> um, but like that is what fucking causes muscle growth. And yeah. these bullshit, well, there's other things you can do. So here's one, cardio. You do cardio right after leg session, it actually reduces how sore you're going to get. Why? Because it's washing out a lot of the metabolites that cause that immune response and cause that growth. And it's contracting the muscles in ways that basically takes them from a a biochemical signal of, okay, let's let's really grow to one of like, oh, oh shit, we're still on. Uh, Fuck it. Forget this growth shit. We got to be active. So doing cardio right after a hypertrophy leg workout is a fucking bad idea. It's not the worst idea in the world, but it will cost you. So yes, just getting on the step mill with your fucking headphones in, hoodie up. It's hardcore. It's dope as fuck. After chest, great. After back, great. After quads, do not do that shit. Get in your fucking car, drink your protein shake, go home, sit down and chill the fuck out. At 9 p.m. later that night when your legs are settled, you have a few meals in them then you come back and get on the step mill and it causes much less interference wow you should have been around like 10 years ago i, I would have i should have talked to you 10 years ago and you i wish been... i had a time machine man no i uh no you know why i you know it's funny so i used to not all the time but i there was a period of time where i was doing legs and then i would walk for 20 minutes at like a slow pace like 2.5 three miles yeah. per hour that's not terrible, by the way. That barely does anything. Well, I would do that for 20 minutes post-workout because I found that it was reducing my soreness. Yes. But I guess I was yes. also reducing my growth. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. Jeez. Um, do you believe, this is just a random thought came to mind because John used to say it all the time. Do you believe the textbook is always the indicator in the gym or do you believe that the reality does not always indicate what's in the textbook? The textbook 
is a very first pass, very low level, very developmental tool for helping basic understanding. And the textbook fails on two counts. One, it doesn't know everything about the human body, not even close. So there's stuff in the gym that you're going to see written in textbooks published in 2027, but it's 2023. You got to do the right shit right now, even though the textbook just has nothing to say about the matter. That's the mm -hmm. first way textbooks are, are limited. We know more than textbooks know. We know textbooks plus our own internal knowledge. Mm -hmm. And two, there are situations in which the textbook just tells you general shit, but you have to make specific choices in the gym based on how your body feels. Mm -hmm. So the textbook will say, well, generally progressive overload is good. And you go back, okay, am I in a position where I can progressively overload? No, then I have to take a light session. The textbook doesn't say that, but you're just using your intelligence and how your body feels. Also, the textbook will be like, here are good exercises for the quads, the squat, the hack squat, the leg press, and they're all, research shows they're roughly equivalent. Now, how does research work? You take 50 guys, you give them all three different workouts, mix and match the fucking controls, and you see on average who grows the most muscle, and it all comes out the same. But if you look subject by subject, some guys get double the growth from a hack squat that they do from the leg press. On average, there's some other guy getting double leg press, half hack squat, so the averages even out. Textbooks are built on averages. They're built on statistical abstractions. When they say you know, the bench press is roughly equivalent to the dumbbell press and muscle growth, doesn't mean for every single human being in every situation. That means for the fucking 50 undergrads they studied at the you know, University of Western Ontario or whatever that one time they did the study. Yeah. So you have to understand that the textbook is the base foundation of your knowledge. And then on top of that, you layer uh, intricate knowledge we don't understand yet the textbooks don't have, part one, and part two, your own biofeedback to be like, you know what? The bench isn't very good for me. It just hurts my shoulders. It doesn't cause a lot of pec pump or soreness, but the dumbbell press is fucking awesome and it causes a ton of, of soreness for me. And I don't care because somebody could say like, why aren't you doing bench today? And you're like, well, I actually feel it more in the dumbbell press. And like, well, uh, in the textbook, I read that like, technically speaking, they're equivalent. <laughs> and you're like, shut up, nerd. You punch them in the face, their glasses break. You know, typical shit, yeah, Harry yeah. Potter. But like, <laughs> um, yeah, the textbook is dope as a baseline, but it only speaks to averages and general principles. It doesn't give you specific advice and it doesn't know everything. So the textbook is like a, a best analogy is like a fucking map. I know this even fucking Google Maps is like Google Maps. You're walking through a neighborhood to your boy's house and you're a little drunk and you're like, Google Maps says we should be here. And your friend's looking, it's like a fucking dumpster. And you're like, okay, what are you going to be like? No, Google Maps never lies. Like, okay, fuck it. Let's have a fucking party in the dumpster. I'm sure your friend lives in there. What the fuck is wrong with you? Obviously, the map got us pretty close. Now we got to open our eyes and look around. That's yeah, how yeah. training textbooks work. Like textbook, I wouldn't straight up ignore the shit. But you have, fuck the textbook. Textbooks are lame. Uh, that's dumb. You just don't know how to read. I get it. Uh, but uh, you got to be smart. But there's a level of wisdom you get in the gym that's irreplaceable. And it's a huge part of that equation, often the bigger part. Yeah, no, I love that because... Uh... Look, I take I take a lot of what I learned from John, and um, he used to always say the same thing. It's like, look, there's a base, but there are some things that just don't translate in the gym. Totally. So, so yeah, I'm glad. Okay, so I'm glad we're I'm kind of getting through some of these myths. Um, failure. How long, how long do you have? We've been on for quite a while now. It's been. Really I, I got whatever you got, man. I'm I'm. Uh, okay. I got another I, at least uh, at least twenty minutes. I love talking to you because it's like. Uh, I feel like it's a very nuanced conversation. There's a lot of flexibility. And I think a lot of conversation in bodybuilding is spoken in absolutes. Totally. And it's something I really hate because I'm like, it's, it's never absolute. And I'm trying to yeah. just really drive that point home um, when it comes to failure. So you've emphasized failure a few times throughout this podcast. <clears throat> Do you believe that you can grow without failure? And I, and the only reason I say that, and just for reference, I've always believed in training to failure but there are sessions where john has put me through and said look i don't want you to go to failure i want you to go heavy but i want you to just do sets of five i want mm -hmm. like uh, and i think people call it reps in reserve now i'm too mm -hmm. old to know, i'm too old to know mm -hmm. these terms but um you know you can do eight or ten but i want you to stop at five but i want you to do them more explosively and then just do five sets instead of three and mm -hmm. do that for a few exercises right so it's it's modified but it's not to failure but I think the workload ends up being the same. Is that is that a way to train or is that going to be less conducive to muscle growth? It's going to be a little less conducive to muscle growth because when you get to about three reps shy of failure, that's when you start to get gains that are just about the same as you would get from failure except for some nuanced exceptions and complications. It's kind of like 
on average, like that's where the shit starts to get good. Okay. If you're five reps shy of failure, do you get some growth? Yes, absolutely. Especially if you're beginner or intermediate, do you get your best growth? Usually the answer is no. Mm-hmm. Four reps shy of failure, now we're a bit more in the money. Three reps shy of failure, we're Gucci. Two reps shy of failure, you'd have to really peel apart how that is even different from failure and providing muscle growth because it's usually about the okay. same. Okay. One rep shy of failure is you're doing amazing. And if you're going to failure, you're definitely getting the best possible acute in that session muscle growth stimulus for sure. Uh, sure. The only better stimulus would be if you went beyond failure, like drop sets and shit like that. That would even be even, even better. Yeah. The problem with religiously saying you have to go to failure is failure provides a, a great stimulus, but oftentimes a crazy amount of fatigue. And mm-hmm. that's fatigue you'll have to deal with in the next session and the next session and the next session. And for some folks, if they can pull back a little bit early in a mesocycle, early in a program, and then get closer to failure later, they get that best combination of getting the easy gains first and then getting closer to the most challenging possible thing. Whereas if you religiously have to go to failure every single time, it's going to work. But it might not work ideally because the amount of fatigue you sum up after a few weeks means you have to back off sooner. And if Mm -hmm. you just backed off a little early, you could have still got your best gains and be able to push the pace at the very end so is it better okay fully understand so and and just for reference when john used to have me do that it would be if like we did two chest days a week there would be one extremely heavy one and one which he he would call a 75 percenter so like that's the one we're not going to failure on but just for people watching so when you say uh, one of the worst parts of failure i'm paraphrasing obviously one of the one of the negatives of failure is that uh, you're going to get extremely tired and 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 not be able to continue in your training progress. Mm-hmm. Um, do you believe in failure through every exercise of one workout, or is it uh, every workout, every exercise for a week? Like when when do you suggest somebody would pull back? Like, do I go to failure on one exercise in a workout and then not the other, mm-hmm. or? Or is it every exercise every day for three days? Like where? Yeah, yeah. It's a sliding scale. There are a bunch of different ways to do it that are, are really good. My preferred way is let's say I'm training hard for four weeks and then the fifth week I'm going a little easier to let the body recover. That's a lot of times how we train at RP. That's how the app works and stuff like that. In your first week of training, you have, you're fresh from your last break. Because you're fresh, your muscles don't actually require a crazy amount of stimulus to get their best growth you have chosen some new exercises, new rep ranges, new techniques, the novelty itself is going to cause a lot of growth. So you don't have to do as many sets as normal, you have to do fewer sets. And you actually don't have to push it all the way to failure. So what I would do in that first week is just get like two or three reps away from failure, which is what the app recommends. Stop, write down your reps, or the app writes them down for you or whatever. The next week you come in, you add a little bit of weight or a few reps to that, and it automatically gets you closer to failure. The next week you go even further and you automatically get closer and closer to failure until in your last week before deloading, every work set that you do in that week is Mm -hmm. to failure. Okay. You can't actually go much longer than a week doing that with a high volume training program. Sure. That's how I would do it. There's another way to do it. There's a way where you never get to failure and you just always keep two or three reps in the tank every single week. The, 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 and that's a great way to train. It results in great uh, um, muscle growth. Jay Cutler trained like that his entire career. Like he's been on record saying, I actually never went to failure. Yeah. The problem with that is that if it, it, it can work and it can work great, but there's a way in which you can fuck yourself up. And this is it. Um, if you never push yourself to failure, you never know how many real reps in reserve you're working with. You tell yourself, I'm stopping too shy. But if you do that for months and years, and someone gets in, like a training partner comes in, you know, for visiting from another town. He's like, let's fucking get after it. And you're like, fuck it, let's go to failure. And you like go from 10 reps on the leg press, what you thought was two reps in reserve, you get 18. And you're like, yeah. God damn it. I've been sandbanging. I didn't even know. So it's good to occasionally get to failure because yeah. like it, it's a real world test. The other thing is you can say, okay, fuck that. Fuck this high volume bullshit. Dorian, uh, Jordan Peters, those are my fucking guys. I'm fucking British blood all the way. I'm going to lower my training volume so that the insane fatigue of going to failure is not a big deal because I don't ever train that much, but I go fucking hard when I go dope. Great way to train. It works super well. The downside potentially is for some folks, the stimulus goes up by 
20% from not going to failure, the fatigue goes up by 120%. And then you just can't sustainably kick that in for weeks and weeks and weeks. You're going to go hard for a few weeks and then you're going to get weaker. And you're like, oh my fucking God, I'm way too overreach. I need a deload. So your ratio of how much quality training you're getting within a given year to how much time you spend resting goes up so much that someone could be like, why are you going that hard if it just means taking more breaks? Why don't you go a little less hard, do a bit more volume, you actually get more high quality shit in. It's kind of like, I don't know, the terrible analogy, but like, if you're, you know, start having sex, you're like, I'm a one fucking zero, 150 kind of guy, you just fucking pound it like crazy. Like, there are times for that, yes, but that's not every time for that situation. So training shy of failure has great benefits, but it has the downside of maybe you aren't pushing it hard enough, and how can you tell if you never go to failure? Going to failure all the fucking time as the downside of you need to crank your volume down so much that you might not be getting your best overall long-term muscle growth even though training is fun as fuck and you always know you're giving it your best those are great things but you might be taking some time off the bat it's like if you have a car if you always fucking redline it you know you're putting i'm getting everything out of this fucking trans am that i've paid for but also you won't have that trans am for as long as you wanted because the fucking transmission is going to kick out and you're like ah you go to the mechanics they're like so how have you been treating it you're like I fucking maximum all the time. And they're like, you're a fucking idiot. (laughs) Here's a $5,000 IOU. So there's some trade-offs there. And there's also a huge individual difference on preference and on actual physiological response. Some guys go to failure all the fucking time. They love it. They're not overreached. They try submaximal training, RAR. It's fucking lame. It doesn't work. They don't get as good of results. They hate it. Fuck that. Stick to the fa- stick to training to failure all the time. Just modulate your volume so that you're not always overreached or overtrained. Some guys, they'll go to failure, and for them, it'll be this crazy psychological fatigue. Like some people, they go to failure, they just like go, 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 and then, uh, and then they stop and everything's fine. Same facial expression, maybe they grit their teeth a little bit. For some people going to failure, they can get demons out, bro. They start yeah, yeah. using demons to get to failure, and then that's like a religious experience of a workout. You cannot do that every week. Guys like that, they're better off like just to stick to two reps in reserve. Training hard is never a problem for you because you're fucking insane. You don't need failure to push it. And ironically, with some of the guys in the pro ranks and i'm not trying to talk some shit i'll gladly talk some shit but uh i'll let you know when it's shit talking some of the guys in the pro ranks have such great genetics and they never really worked all that hard that if they go and train with jp or they go train with dorian that's the first time they've really been pushed close to their limits and they get radical growth and they'll be like it's the failure and it's like yeah for you it is because you never kind of a bitch but for like a lot of natural guys small evidence-based fucking guys you see them training in the gym they're not big they're not strong but you'll see them take a set to failure and you're like watching their face and you're like dude you're going through some shit bro holy fuck for them it's like you're you're gonna train just hard enough you need to back the fuck up because you're like crying in the middle of a set all the time and see actually jp himself he's been on record saying the way i train is for me mentally Period. I'm not talking about science, I'm not talking about results. This is the shit I want to do. Because JP yeah. goes to some fucking places in his training when he's trained to failure, yeah. which is why his program is relatively low frequency and lower volume because he's smart and he knows he can't just do everything high volume. Hard. For the first few years of my training, I did high volume, everything to failure. And yeah. when I backed off, I got amazing results. Yeah. And I was like, oh shit. But there is such a thing as too much backing off. You get these motherfuckers, these TikToking assholes put their fucking knee wraps on, expensive weightlifting shoes, fucking 10 RIR. And they're like, I'm evidence based selfie. Get the fuck out of here. Go on the leg press and cry for a bit. That'll man you up. I put think some hair those, in your chest. I think those guys are ruining it for you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 100%. Because they're I just want to say they do not represent me. <laughs> they're like, I do RIR. Tag Dr. Mike. I'm like, don't fucking tag me in this shit. <laughs> I can think of a few pros just to defend them. Uh, you know, guys like obviously there's Mr. Olympias that we can see like that. Like sure. Ron, Ronnie's training was out of this world, uh, even though people don't agree with the form and all that. But the yeah, the sheer intensity of it. Uh, when I think of like Brett Wilkin, uh, his he, I've seen him take some sets to places. I'm like, this is wild, right? Hunter, yeah, Le- yeah. Hunter Labrada comes to mind. Yeah, yeah. Uh, same type of mentality. These guys are low, vo- lower volume. I don't think Brett's yeah, yeah. a lower volume guy, but Hunter's a lower volume guy. But like, just when they go to the end, it's like you can tell yeah. it's it's the end. Oh yeah, and just to make sure people don't <laughs> think like that's the only way you have to train. There's just Justin Shire. I mean, like, hey, you ever watch him train? 
He's yeah. a fucking machine. I've trained with, I've like, trained with him. Yeah, like a literal machine. And yeah. like his last rep looks exactly like his first. And he's like, yeah. and then he puts it down. And you're like, wow, okay, that was it. Like, I have a, I have a question about man. that. I have a question about that because I saw it on your uh, full ROM page. Mm -hmm. um, okay, two questions. I know you don't have too much time, so we'll make these kind of quick. Or you can make them as quick or as long as you want. Sure, but sure, two, sure. Two questions I'll throw out. One, should it always be full range of motion? And two, is there a place for cheat reps? Yeah, good question. So full range of motion is generally superior to partial range of motion, but it's especially superior when what is included in the full range of motion is that bottom deep stretch. This, the deep stretch while under load, like if you're doing pull downs, not stopping here, but going fucking ripping your lats out yeah, yeah. super deep with the dumbbell flies. If you're missing out on that bottom stretch, which like, look, on nine times out of 10, the people at leg press will miss out on that. And the number one reason is they just don't want to take weight off the bar because they got big egos. And also like it blows dick to go deep in squats and leg presses. Like it physically hurts you. It's the nastiest combination of more physical pain and you get to be less impressive because you're using less weight. Mm -hmm. So that bottom stretch, I wouldn't miss that. There's tons of research now saying that's superior to the rest of it. So in that regard, if your full ROM includes that bottom stretch, you can even do bottom end partials. Like if you take dumbbell flies, you, you can be yeah. down here and come up, down here and come up, and that's yeah. totally yeah. fine. You don't yeah. have to come up and fucking touch them every time. That's nonsense. But if you're missing that bottom stretch, you're robbing yourself. Yeah. So first. Second of all, sorry, what was uh, question number two was? Cheat reps. Cheat reps. Cheat reps. Cheat reps have uses. The thing is you have to consider the costs as well as the benefits and you have to consider of other ways of getting the shit done. What is the purpose of, let's say you do curls is the easiest one. You're doing barbell curls. You do 10 strict reps and then you want to do more. Like you've gone to failure. The 10th one is like barely moves. You're saying, okay, I'm gonna do some cheat reps. So I'm gonna get my hips into it. What is the purpose of the cheat rep? It's to take the muscle beyond failure. Mm -hmm. Dope, got it. The upside is you'll get more growth in that set. Cool. What's the downside? The systemic fatigue from moving the rest of your body around is like a thing. You swing around enough with a curl bar, your back's going to be a little bit more sore, more tired, your hips, your hamstrings. You got back and hamstrings tomorrow. You got quads the day after that. Some amount of cheating just poisons the system. And, you know, you're here to train biceps. Use your biceps, motherfucker. You don't need the rest of your body for that shit. But then you say, okay, I got that. But how do we continue to stimulate the biceps further, even though the set is over and we get you know, to a mechanical failure? Don't we have to cheat? The answer is no. You can take weight off the bar and do a drop set. Same concept as cheating, continuing the set after it's done beyond failure. But now you don't have to cheat at all. You don't have to have that poisonous effect of fatigue. And also, what about injury risk? How many people you've seen pop their bicep doing a curl? I've actually never seen it. How many people have popped their bicep doing a curl when doing some dumb shit where they're swinging around? I've seen that in the gym literally a few times myself. So cheat reps, you don't, you want to be a precise person in the gym, especially as a high level bodybuilder, you're building a beautiful, precise machine. Cheating is going to have an effect where it might cause injury or might cause excessive fatigue. There are better ways to get to going beyond failure than cheat reps. One is taking some weight off the bar. Two is just doing rest pause or Maya reps. You just wait for three seconds and then you do two more reps. You put it down, you wait for three seconds, you do two more strict reps. Cheating has another downside. The same bodybuilders, They'll be like, yeah, fucking cheat reps are dope, man. They're the fucking shit. Well, at the same time, be like, yeah, man, mind muscle connection, super important. How the fuck are you going to connect with mind muscle when you're doing this fucking dumb shit right here? Can I, can I touch on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Yes. So I just, I'll give you an example. Um, and I, and I'm not saying you're wrong, but this no, is no, no, just... please say I'm wrong. It's totally fine. I could be wrong. <clears throat> no, 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 I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm really not. I just, everybody kind of trains their own way and this is something I do. So me and Paul were doing uh, biceps just last week, and this came to mind when you were saying it. So when you say mind-muscle connection, we, we were doing a set where it was 15 reps. Mm -hmm. And the first 10 reps, slow negatives, not slow, but controlled negatives. Controlled negatives, yeah. Uh, explosive, concentric, and then a squeeze at the top, right? Perfect 10 reps. Uh, you're kind of burnt at 10 reps. Like we made it, we made it so that like at 10 reps, you're kind of cooked. Like you're not really mm -hmm. going to be able to do another proper rep. Mm -hmm. The next five reps were a faster concentric, a faster eccentric with maybe a little bit of body movement. Mm -hmm. Right. 
but I felt like that extra five reps and I, I don't want to call them cheat curls, but they were just faster. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And a little cheaty. More uh, cheaty. Yeah. Not, we'll say cheaty, not cheat. Reps. <laughs> I didn't cheat on you, baby. I just got a little cheatier. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, but, uh, but I felt like those extra five reps just pumped more blood. And this is kind of yeah. goes back to what I was saying earlier about wanting to maximize the pump. Yeah. So when people do that, I don't feel like it's an ego thing. Like we only, we only, we're only using 60 pounds yeah. on, you know what I mean? So it wasn't like we were, and there's nobody in the gym. Like I have my own private facility. So it's not like we're showing off for anybody. Um, but I felt like that was a benefit. So you don't think that those kind of reps are useful. They're, they're super useful, Fod. They're super fucking useful. It was a benefit. There may be other ways to do it, which give you all the benefits and eliminate the downsides. Okay. Um, so, for example, another way for me to, if I was being a dick, mm -hmm. when you said, okay, so first reps we did really well, and the second reps are like the, the eccentrics a little faster, a little bit more body English. If I was a dick, I'd be like, so what you're saying is the last five reps were of a purposefully lower quality, and you would have to agree with me. Yeah, they yeah. were. Yes. But they, but they were because the muscle was fatigued. Yes, but they didn't have to be because you could have just rested for five seconds and done yeah. another five perfect quality reps. You would have the combined effect of a way bigger pump, everything you got out of those cheat reps, yeah. except with zero bad technique, better mind muscle connection, yeah. no increased probability of injury. Another one is just a drop set. You just like 60 and then go to 45. And then the 45 is another yeah, yeah, five yeah. reps and it gets well, the same thing going. We, we do all that. Like, look, we mix up a lot of things. So we do do a lot of pause reps and stuff like that. Like we'll, we'll do we'll do pause sets where we're, I don't know, not pause reps. Sorry. We'll do, um, rest, pause, rest, pause sets where mm -hmm. we'll do the 10. Then we'll just put the weight down for 10 seconds and then yep. just go to failure. So yep. we do that stuff too, but yep. I just throw in like whatever we're feeling that day. We're like, you know what? Let's just crank out five more. Totally. So I, but I do understand what you're saying. That does make sense. We could have done it a different way. Yeah. Done a different way that doesn't have the known downsides of cheating, higher injury risk, uh, difficulty tracking because like you know if you're into tracking what the fuck do you write down in your rp hypertrophy app like 10 really good do. five bad i don't know right like and, and, and writing shit down is some nerd shit that doesn't fucking really matter but at the end of the day if you do write shit down like if you're jp right what is jp gonna write down if he did cheat reps i don't think he does mm. cheat reps he just mm. does the fucking reps and then when the set is over the set is fucking over so there's that downside injury risk is higher when you're cheating obviously with a fucking 60 pound cable curl or whatever whatever the fuck like it's a minimal but yeah. there are ways to cheat other exercises that do marginally increase the probability of injury to an uncomfortable extent like uh bent rowing really heavy you start fucking doing a lot of the jerking like yeah, yeah, and oh yeah. my fucking back like what the fuck did you think was going to happen like yeah. is that a deadlift or a bent row fucking make up your mind yeah there's a mind muscle connection loss there or you just kind of moving weight around you ideally want reps done in kind of like, let's say like Dorian Yates style, sure. where it's like mind, muscle, everything pours into that fucking muscle, which means the reps have to be high quality and they have to look Justin Shire, the fucking same every rep. That's mm -hmm. the best quality of training you can get. Does that mean that doing a wiggly drop set afterwards is terrible? No, it's going to cause more muscle growth, but there may be better ways of doing that, which isn't to say the way you did was yeah. terrible. It's effective. Yeah. There may be just slightly more effective, slightly lower risk ways of doing it like my reps and rest pause sets like drop sets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we prefer to do, Jared and I, because mm -hmm. when we have a technique on an exercise, that's the best technique we know to do. That's the technique for every single fucking rep. And if we want to do more reps, we either rest or take weight off the bar and then we do more reps. Or here's another one, just do another set. I think yeah. a lot of times guys will cheat at the end of a set. I'm not saying this is what you were doing. As a matter of fact, almost certainly wasn't. Some guys will do cheat reps because it's just too lazy to do another set. Like, yeah, man, I get my set done and then I do a down set and I'm out. Shut the fuck up. Do three sets, pussy. What's wrong with you? Like well, you're in here to work, right? Work quality. I think for, for me, what it was is there's a level of, in, I don't want to say intensity. There's a level of tension in the bicep that I get from extending a set mm -hmm. uh without pausing without resting without mm -hmm. taking weight off mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's kind of why i did it i'm like yeah my bicep after 10 reps hurts this much i can make it hurt this much mm -hmm. if i just keep going and use a little bit of yeah sloppy form for the lack of a better word Yes. And if you've experimented with a few of those methods and you found that a little bit of gentle kind of cheating, a little wiggling gives you the best stimulus and 
obviously it's like super low weight. You're not going to get hurt. It doesn't add a ton of systemic fatigue because you're barely moving the rest of your body. If you're honest about it, and that actually is a very good method for you to use, fucking God bless you. You get Mm -hmm. my scientific nod of approval. Mm -hmm. The problem is 99 times out of 100, motherfuckers in the gym that are cheating their asses off, they're doing it to avoid the hard stuff. Like, yeah, man, I go all the way down to leg press. When I can't anymore, I do partials. Fuck you. Partials? What? Why? Because it hurts too much to go any lower. That's why you're quitting. What you need to do is do some bottom end partials. Nobody does that. How many times do you see people do bottom end partials? Nobody does that shit because it's brutal. That's why you're not doing it. Yeah, that's always the the only partial I tell people to do is the one the hardest part which is the bottom part yeah uh, that was actually my next question for you is you don't consider consider partials cheating do you because like if i do if i do 10 reps let's say i do 10 reps of barbell curls and then i can't do a full rep anymore and i just do the bottom half mm-hmm. for another five or ten just to get mm-hmm. a maximum pump or more tension in the bicep is that something you also consider cheating or is that a valuable technique if you are doing it in a way that is uncontrolled and unplanned, it's egotistically based, and you're doing it in a way that avoids the hard stuff, it's cheating. Okay. If you're doing it in a controlled way that is safe, you've pre-planned it ahead of time, and you're taking it to the teeth of the hardest part of the movement, it's yeah. just an intelligent use of training. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, we've, I've covered like every myth I could think of for now, but I, there's a million other questions I want to ask you, but... We've been on for almost two hours already. I just have one more question. Uh, how long have you been doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for? Fuck. Ten years? Really? Yeah. Is it, is it like a major passion of yours? You do it every like every week? Yeah. Is it consistent? Multiple or times it... a week, yeah. yeah. Really? Oh, eh? Yeah, super consistent. How hard is that? I have a that? brown belt, so yeah. How hard is that while maintaining a training program or being in the gym? Yeah. I have to dial down my physicality in jujitsu and focus mostly on being smooth and technical because if I was to grind, it, I've done that before, it costs you everything in the gym. And I'm older now, I'm 39. I'm trying to take a whack at a master's pro card, see if it happens. You know, I got to put my fucking ducks in a row. So yeah. when I do jujitsu nowadays, I do flow style, and if I lose a role because I wasn't willing to use my strength, I just got to get better technically. I no longer push it super hard. I did when I was a white belt, blue belt. I had monster mega rolls, pick people up and throw them, shit like that. And that's fun, but you get a ton of of nagging injuries. Yeah. You can get pretty catastrophic injuries. Thank God I never got any of those. I, yeah. I did have a jiu-jitsu session, and I showed up to train legs, and I did absolutely tear my adductor. Uh, because of jujitsu. So it's combat, right? Like it's, yeah. it gets as real as it gets. Yeah. Uh, you can train jujitsu in an intelligent way that really takes it more easy and learns the technique. It's actually better for you to train that way because you learn more technique and you can always dial up the intensity whenever you want, yeah. but it's difficult, especially if you're an egotistical male, such as myself, because there's some like purple belt who weighs 180 is lying on top of me. I'm like, I could crap. sweep him. Right. But it, I would just, I would have to use more energy and I would be, make it bad for my back workout tomorrow. So I just yeah. let him win on points. Like, God damn it. That hurts the fucking soul. You know, <laughs> fuck that, you know, crank on his ass and beat him. And then my fucking back is tired and the workout yeah. doesn't go as well. There's a huge trade off. There's a lot of guys trying trying to get into jujitsu that are also into lifting and a big question we get and there's actually a youtube video that i have about talking about the trade-offs there's guys that like jujitsu is like it's good for lifting and i'm like it's terrible for your lifting but it's going to make you a killing machine which is fucking sweet so if i never did jujitsu i'd be a better bodybuilder absolutely but uh yeah i got issues from childhood so i gotta be able to fight people every now and again or i don't really feel like i'm safe to go out in public you know so (laughs) (laughs) mike i uh I'm going to let you go because I feel bad I've kept you on so long, but I would like you to come back if you could at some point, just so we can talk about more of, I know you do a YouTube channel with some philosophy stuff. And I do want to get into that because I, oh, enjoy shit. I enjoy that a lot. Um, all right. And we didn't get into any of your backstory and how you got ah, here whatever, and all that. All right. No, it's not. I'm, I'm actually curious. I'm very curious. It's I just, just mostly porn addiction. You know? that... <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, if you have some time, I don't know. We'll pick a date, you know, whenever. And uh, I'd, I'd love, love you to, to. come back and, and talk more. I'd be honored, man. It's been a great time. Is there anything you want to, uh, anybody you want to thank? Anything you want to plug? Anything you want to say before we go? Uh, I want to thank uh, Mr. Jared Feather for uh, being, uh, you know, my friend and working with RP and 
being an actually good bodybuilder, I'm like myself and making all the <laughs> connections and making people like you aware of people like me. So that's yeah. a big deal. He's a great follow on, on social media. Um, as far as plugging shit, yeah, just go watch uh, Renaissance Periodization YouTube videos. You'll see my face on them and instantly recoil because I'm ugly. And then you'll know to click on it because it's got like jokes and knowledge and shit like that. And then if you want to, you know, subscribe to the app, like I get a, like you said before, this is not an advertisement for the app. If you don't like the app, fuck the app. You know what I'm saying? But if yeah. it helps you with training and you like it, give it a download. And it's not in any of the stores. It's a web app. So you just go on to the fucking YouTube channel, click any of our new YouTube videos, newish videos. It's the first link in the description. Click through. You'll get a chance to use it. And uh, that's it. You know, uh, fine. You know, I've got social media and I talk that shit on there, too. But the YouTube's where we do most of our educating and all that stuff. OK, well, if you want to send me all the links, I can put them in the description section. Anybody following can check out the description section for all of uh Mike's, i love that can i Mike's... throw my only fans in there for it? only if it's like the bulk of it is feet it's actually okay so i lied i don't have an only fans <laughs> i do have three only feet accounts in different languages is there only feet i don't know i was okay. a joke yeah, I thought, I, yeah. are you gonna doubt that i thought Yo, one time I, I had an idea i came up with like i was like okay what what kind of app it would be good a great name for like like dating apps or whatever and i was like fuck swipe like fuck swipe that's it and then at some point i'd make jokes with my friends and then i googled it and it was like a real thing that someone already made and i was like god damn it they beat me to fuck swipe so yeah only feet almost certainly is a fucking fuck website. swipe I is a great fuck swipe is a great name actually yeah isn't it great you want to uh, fuck you got to swipe like hinge and all these other ones like i don't want to hinge anyone i don't know what the fuck tinder is except for little fire burning shit i want to yeah. fuck someone and i want to swipe my way to it fuck swipe best name of all time <laughs> uh mike i've had a lot of fun man you're you're great to talk to and uh thank you for expelling a lot of myths and imparting your knowledge on me and my audience uh I'd like to do it again soon. I will be in, in contact and we'll get something done. Awesome. Fod. Huge honor. Thank you so much. Okay, Mike. Thank you.